morning, everybody. So I'm coming to you from the classroom today instead of my library at home because we had a little bit of a problem with my last video that I shot. It was too big and I couldn't upload it from my phone. So just to review, the, at the end of that video, I held up my iPad and showed you the message that said, the floor and seventh, four past the nine on door number two, crossbones. Who in their right mind could decipher such nonsense? Certainly not us. So now today we'll pick up with their research. All the advertisements came between the years 1959 and 1963 and all appeared in the Skeleton Creek Irregular. Then, in 1964, they ceased altogether, as if they had never existed at all. But the same symbols could still be found in various places. One of the symbols, two bones tangled in barbed wire, could be seen above the door to the local bar, on a signpost at the edge of town, and again carved into a very old tree along a pathway into the woods. It made us wonder if the members of the Crossbones were still meeting. Who had been part of the society? What was its function? Were there still active members? And if so, who were they? Our trail dead ended with the advertisements. We searched relentlessly online for clues to our town's past. New York Gold and Silver was bankrupted over environmental lawsuits. <coughs> remember, excuse me, remember I told you the dredge was not friendly to the environment? That's why the lawsuits. And it seemed to vanish into thin air after 1985. But this didn't keep us from sneaking down the dark path into the woods to examine what was left behind. Do I wish we'd never gone down that path? Yes. No. I don't know. It's too complicated. Or is it? None of this would have happened if we'd stayed away from the dredge. The dredge is a crucial part of the town's dreary past. It sits alone and unvisited in the deepest part of the dark woods. The dredge we discovered was a terrible machine. Its purpose was to find gold and its method was grotesque. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, the dredge sat in a muddy lake of its own making. It dug deep into the earth and hauled gargantuan buckets of stone and debris into itself. Nothing escaped its relentless appetite. Everything went inside the dredge. Trees and boulders and dirt clods the size of my head were sifted and shaken with a near deafening racket. And then it was all spit out behind in piles of rubble 10 feet high, a tail of ruin, miles and miles in length. Also tiny bits of gold could be sifted out. The trench that was left behind as the dredge marched forward formed the 22 mile stream bed that zigzags wildly along the edge of town and up into the low part of the mountain. The gutted earth filled with water and the banks were strewn with whitewashed limbs that looked like broken bones. Skeleton Creek. The new waterway torn from earth and stone was called Skeleton Creek by a man in a suit from New York. Maybe it had been a joke, maybe not. Either way, the name stuck. Soon after, the town took the name as well. It would seem that New York Gold and Silver held enough sway over Linkford to change the town name to whatever it wanted. The greatest discovery, or the worst, depending on how you look at it, that Sarah and I made involved the untimely death of a workman on the dredge. There was only one mention of the incident in the newspaper and nothing anywhere else. Old Joe Bush is what they called him, so I can only conclude that he was not a young man. Old Joe Bush had let his pant leg get caught in the gears and the machinery of the dredge had pulled him through, crushing his leg bone to gravel. Then the dredge spit him out into the grimy water. His leg was demolished and under the deafening sound in the dark night, no one heard him scream. Old Joe Bush never emerged from the black pond below. Monday, September 13, 10 p.m. Okay, I think everyone is asleep now. It's as safe as it's going to get. Late last night, on my arrival home from the hospital, I was reunited with my computer. This may seem like a strange thing to write, but the already walloping power of a computer is magnitude even more for people like me in a small, isolated town. It is the link to something not boring, not dull, not dreary. It has always been especially true in my case because Sarah is constantly making videos, posting them, and asking me to take notice. One simple click. That's all it can take for your life to change. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the much worse. But we don't think about it. No, we just click. There's a certain video she made 15 days ago, a day before the accident. This video is like a road sign that says, 
You've gone too far. Turn back. I'm afraid to look at it again because I know that after I watch it, I'm going to have even more of a bewildering sense that my life has been broken into two parts. Everything that came before this video, everything that would come after. As much as I don't want to, I'm going to stop writing now. There is a safety in writing late into the night, but I can't put off watching it again. I have to see it once more, now that things have changed, for the worse. It might help me. It might not. But I have to do it. I have to. I'm afraid, but it's so simple. Go to Sarah's name online, sarahfincher.com. Enter the password, House of Usher. Then click return. One click. Do it, Ryan. Do it. And that, my friends, brings us to our very first video. This is the picture and the page from the actual book. If you can see that. I will go back, go to that website, enter that password, and we'll see what we think. We'll actually watch the video twice because the first time I want you to observe everything that's happening, so look with your eyes. The second time through, I want you to pay attention to the sounds. Pay attention to what you hear more than what you see. If you tend to get a little scared, you might want to either leave the room or cover your eyes and plug your ears. Good luck. 